there's a distinction without a difference. Think of it in terms, if you will, as fruit. <coughs> Some fruit you call oranges. Mm -hmm. Some fruit you call apples, bananas, grapes. They are all distinct, which is why we refer to them as different things. Apples, oranges, grapes. But there's one thing that makes them the same, and that is they are all fruit. <laughs> uh -huh. the, it's a distinction without a difference. It's one in the same. It's a distinction without a difference. Jessica and Brandon were potential employees for the same office management position that only required a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Jessica was a Caucasian college graduate with <coughs> no office management experience. Brandon, on the other hand, was an African-American college dropout with at least five years of college experience or with at least five years of office management experience. Mm -hmm. After the interviewing process had concluded, the job was given to Jessica while Brandon remained in the unemployment line. Mm. Curious to know why he was not accepted to receive a job that only required him to have a high school diploma. Brandon emailed his potential employer. In response to Brandon's email, his potential employer responded very bluntly by saying, you did not receive the position to be the next office manager of our company because our company believes that women office managers work better than male office managers. Brandon was rejected a job opportunity not because he was an Af African American. He was not rejected a job opportunity because he was a college dropout. He was not rejected a job opportunity because of his social status. He was rejected a job opportunity because of his gender. Mm -hmm. Brandon did not get the job because the company made a distinction between male and female. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, one of the sad but true realities of the world that you and I share is that if you live long enough, you'll find out that because of your race, your social status, and or your gender, you will be disqualified for things that you actually qualify for. Yes. Yes. I'll tell you that one more time. You just keep on living. If you haven't experienced any discrimination yet, just keep on waking up in the morning and sooner or later you'll find out that based on your race, your social status, and or your gender, sooner or later you'll find out that you will be disqualified qualified for things that you actually qualify for. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, some people fill out long applications and they choose to answer the question about their ethnicity and although they make enough money to get approved for the loan and although they have meet all of the requirements because they chose to answer the question about their ethnicity, they found out that they were rejected for the loan. Some people have done all kinds of things. There are some neighborhoods, some gated communities that many of us will never get to enjoy, not because of anything other than the fact that we don't meet the social requirement of the other people who are living in the same neighborhood. 
you will be discriminated against based on your race. You can be discriminated against based on your social status, or you can be discriminated against based on your gender. There are several women in here who applied for jobs that they did not get for no other reason than the fact that they were a woman. And there are men in the room who have applied for jobs that they did not get based on the fact that they were a man. It's the fact that there are distinctions being made in the world that you and I share. And if you have not experienced any of these distinctions, just keep on living. And I guarantee you that sooner or later, you'll find out that for one of the three reasons that I just mentioned, you will be discriminated against. Whether it is based on your race, whether it is based on your social status, or whether it is based on your gender. But I stood up this morning to to let somebody in the room know that although we live in a world that makes distinctions based on our race and our social statuses and our gender, we serve a God who makes no such distinctions. God doesn't care if you're black or you're white. God does not care if you're rich or you're poor. God does not care if you're male or you're female. If God wants to save you, God save poor people and he save rich people. God save black people and he saved white people God saves males and he also saves females so while yeah. we live in a world that makes distinctions we can celebrate the fact that we don't have to be a certain way in order for God to extend salvation unto us yeah. it's a distinction yeah. without a difference if you don't like short people, you better start liking them. Because when you get to heaven, you'll find out that short people will be there and tall people will be there. If you got some racial bias, you better learn how to get over that thing. Because when you get to heaven, if you plan on going to heaven, you'll find out that there'll be Chinese people there. There'll be Korean people there. There'll be black people there and white people there. It's because God does not make the distinctions that people people make down here on this earth. It's a distinction without a difference. In fact, it brings to my mind that old blues song that says members only. It's a private party. Don't need no money. You qualify. Don't even bring your checkbook. Just bring your broken heart. Red or yellow, black or white. They don't care who you are. You will not be discriminated against when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Question of text then becomes How do you know that you are saved by faith in Christ alone? This is a relevant question to ask. Because we often develop the mentality of the world when it comes to God. Because we live in a world that makes distinctions. We often think that God also makes distinctions. All right. Because we live in a world that has so many requirements for this and so many requirements for that, we think that God also has the same list of requirements in regards to salvation. So we begin to doubt that we are saved if we don't have certain requirements. Now some will tell you that you need to be Jewish in order to be saved. There are some that will, there are Jews who will tell you that you need to be a, if you are a woman, you need to be married to a Jewish male in order to be saved. There are others who will tell you that you need to be circumcised to be saved. There are others who will tell you that you need to be physically baptized in order to be saved. But God doesn't require you to do anything for salvation. Salvation is a gracious gift given to people who need grace. All right. All right. All right. So how do you know? that you are made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ alone. How do you know that Jesus is enough to make you right with God? 
here in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, the Holy Spirit through the promise of Paul proclaims how it is that you and I know that we are saved, that we are made right with God, that we are justified before God by faith in Jesus Christ alone, or as I like to say, plus or minus nothing. First, the text teaches us that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone because Christ conceals the true identity of his followers. Christ conceals the true identity of his followers. In verses 26 through 28, Paul reassures believers that God honors the sacrifice of his son for salvation, not the identity of his servants. You got to feel the tension of that statement I just made. Verses 26 through 28, Paul reassures the churches in Galatia. He reassures the Christians in Galatia as I am going to attempt to reassure you this morning that God honors the sacrifice of his son for salvation, not the, the, the identities of his servants. Let me see if I can make that make sense to you. If you think that God saved you because you find you are sadly mistaken, that, that that man may have became your husband because he thought you was fine, but God makes no such distinctions. God can care less whether you are fine or not. If you think that God saved you because why he couldn't save you, what's not to like about you? Why wouldn't God want me next to him all the time? You are sadly mistaken. That woman may have puffed your head up like that, but God don't care nothing about you having it going on. It's because God did not does not honor the identities of his servants. He only honors the sacrifice of his son when it comes to salvation. And since God only honors the sacrifice of his son, your salvation ain't got nothing but nothing to do with you. God didn't save you because your hair was long. God didn't save you because your eyelashes was on fleek. God didn't save you because you don't wear nothing but the best of name brand clothes. God didn't save you because you got money in the bank. He didn't save you because you got a college education. That may be why your job hired you, too, but that ain't got nothing them to do with why God saved you. You might need all of these requirements to get something in the world, but you don't need to have anything for God to reach down and give you the free gift of salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God honors the sacrifice of his son, not the identities of his servants. Amen. 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 He says, particularly in verse 26. Verse 26 is a trustworthy statement of truth that declares how a sinner becomes a saint in the presence of God. Uh, hear me, church. If you're wondering how you are made right with God, you need to understand verses 26 through 27. But if nothing else, you need to understand verse 26 in particular. Because verse 26 tells us how it is that you and I are made right with God. Or how it is that you and I move from being a sinner to being a saint in the presence of God. The text says... For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All right. you, you are not a son of God for a college education. You did not become a son of God because of your ethnicity. You did not become a son of God because of your race. You did not become a son of God because of your gender. Text says you and I became sons of God, children of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't see it in our English translation. But in the Greek manuscripts, the word faith in verse 26 is preceded by the definite article, the. Literally, the text reads, for you are all sons of God through 
the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in and of itself describes something that a person believes to be true. Faith in and of itself describes something that a person is persuaded is true. There's all kind of truth in the world. There are all kinds of truth about salvation in the world. Some claim that you need to be Jewish to be saved. Some claim that you need to be circumcised to be saved. Some claim that you need to be baptized to be saved. There are all things that people believe are true. But the text lets us know that you are not saved based on what you believe is true. But you are saved based on what is true. What right. is true about salvation? Text says what's true about salvation is that you are saved because you believe the faith. Not because you believe a faith, but because you believe the faith. What is the faith that Paul is referring to here in the text? The faith that Paul is referring to in the text is the faith or the belief or the persuasion that Jesus is the Son of God who came off his throne in heaven and wrapped himself in the uterus of a virgin by the name of Mary. The faith that Paul is referring to here in the text is the faith that Jesus stayed in that uterus nine long months, came out that uterus a whining baby boy, but grew up a soul-saving man. The faith that Paul is referring to here in the text is the faith that Jesus did walk the seashores of Jerusalem and make blind men see, lame men walk, and dead men live. The faith that Paul is referring to here in the text is the faith that Jesus did die one Friday, rest one Saturday, but rise one Sunday morning. The faith that Paul is referring to here in the text is the faith that Jesus did ascend unto heaven where he is now sitting on the right hand side of God and one day he will come back and receive everybody who believes in him unto himself that we may forever be in the presence of the God. It's that faith that you ought to believe that makes you right in the presence of God. Not a faith, the faith. Without the faith, you will not be right in the presence of the Lord. Go ahead and cut your foreskin. Go ahead and convert to Judaism. Go ahead and call yourself a Jew just so you feel like you've been saved. Go ahead and do whatever if you think you need to do in order for salvation. But if you really want salvation, just open up your Bible and read that you, all you need to do for salvation is accept the faith that Jesus is the Son of God who God sent into the world to redeem humanity. Back unto himself. Yes, yes. Amen. Thank you. You're saved by the faith. Right. Not what you think is true, but what is true. Paul continues his explanation of how a person becomes right in the presence of God in verse 27. In verse 27, Paul keeps with his theme of verse 26. In verse 26, Paul is telling us how a person moves from being a sinner in the presence of God to being a saint in the presence of God. And in verse 27, he continues this explanation of telling us how we move from being sinners in the presence of, in the presence of God to being a saint in the presence of God. He says, for all of you, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. We see that word baptism, don't we? And we immediately think of physical baptism. But do you not know that your Bible speaks of two baptisms? Your Bible speaks about water baptism and it also speaks of spiritual baptism. If you are here and you are a member of the church, more than likely you have experienced water baptism. But it is not water baptism that makes you right with God. It is spiritual baptism that makes you right with God. The word baptism is a technical term that paints the picture 
of an object being repeatedly dipped in liquid to be cleaned or to be dyed. It is the picture of a person washing dishes who takes a dirty dish uh -huh. and puts it in soap and water. All right. They emerge that dirty dish in that soap and water. They take a rag or a sponge and they wipe the dish off and they pull that soapy dish out of that soapy water to see if the dish has went from being dirty to clean. To clean. Uh -huh. And if it ain't clean, then they dip it back in the water and rub it some more and, and pull it out to see if the dish is clean. All right. Or it's the picture of a person trying to dye a piece of clothing. Mm -hmm. They fill a bucket with some water in some dye. They take the shirt and dip it in the dye and continuously pull the shirt out of the dye to see if the shirt has become the color that they want it to be. And if it has not become the color that they want it to be, they continuously dip the shirt inside of the water, trying to change the shirt from what it was to what they want it to be. Do you get the picture of baptism? Baptism is about changing who you are, who you were, to who God wants you to be. Physical baptism doesn't change you other than the fact that it just makes you wet and very cold. But spiritual baptism changes you from what you were to what God wants you to be. This is what I mean when I say God conceals the identity or Christ conceals the identity of his service. It's because God don't care nothing about who you are. All God cares is about who his son is. So baptism is to change you from who you were to who God wants you to be so that when Christ, when God sees you, he don't see your messed up self. He sees the blood of his son. That's how I'm made right in the presence of God. It's because when God looks at me, he can't see my messed up self because Christ has concealed my identity. And now instead of looking like my messed up self, I look like the son of God. Amen, amen. If you remember Genesis, a gentleman by the name of Isaac, Isaac has two sons, they're twin boys, this Jacob and Esau. Uh, Esau was technically the firstborn twin, which meant that Esau was entitled to the birthright. He was entitled to inherit everything that his father owned. Yet, their mother, Rachel, thought that her son, Jacob, should be entitled to the birthright. Esau was a hairy guy. Jacob was not. When Isaac had got up in years, it was time to bless the eldest son. To give him the promise to pass on his inheritance to the eldest son. But because Rachel thought that Jacob should be the person to receive the inheritance, she went and got some animals for her, put it on Jacob. Mm -hmm. Brought Jacob into the presence of his father, but by then Isaac was up in age, his eyes had grown dim. He was laying on his bed and he said, come here my son, he saw that the whole time it was Jacob. He touched Esau, or Jacob rather, to see if he was going to bless the right person. But while he was touching him, he said something. He said, you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. <laughs> I wish y'all felt like having church with me this morning. When you're standing in front of the presence of God, you still look like who you are. You, you still got all that nonsense bottled up in you, but God invites you into his presence because although you may be who you are, you look like the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. 
And you receive the blessing not based on who you are, but based on who you look like. Come on now. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. He conceals your identity. And it's a good thing he does. Because who you are and who I am, we're not worthy to go into the presence of the Lord. All the messed up stuff I didn't did and still do and will do in the future. All the messed up thoughts that go through my mind if I stand in front of God in my identity, I'll get rejected every time. But since Christ conceals my identity, God accepts me not based on who I am, but he accepts me based on who Christ is. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If any man be in Christ, right. he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I know that I am made right in the presence of God. I know that I am justified before God. I know that I am welcomed into the presence of God, not because of who I am, but I am welcomed into the presence of God because I have been baptized in Christ. That is, I have been changed. Christ has taken away my identity and given me his identity. And because I have his identity, God welcomes me in his presence. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can try to get in God's presence based on who you are if you want to, but you'll get rejected every time. If you think you need to be Jewish to get into God's presence, go ahead. Be Jewish and see if that gets you in. If you think that you need to be circumcised to get into the presence of God, go ahead. Find you a clinic and somebody who's certified to do such things and see if that'll get you in. You can do whatever it is you think you need to do to get into the presence of God. But as for me, I'm just going to hold on to Jesus Christ and hide behind his identity and depend on him to get me into the presence of his father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Yes, Kid growing up, he had fun outside. You know. Go outside, all the kids were outside. You get thirsty, you walk in the house. You tell your friend, come on in the kitchen. Come on, come on, get you something to drink. Friend walk in, kid, because they feel uneasy about walking into a kitchen. That ain't theirs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yet, mama, daddy, they don't say anything. You get outside, friend want to know, your mama nice. <laughs> she just let me walk in her kitchen. You got to look back and tell your friend, that was because you was <laughs> with me. <laughs> but don't think you can just walk in there <laughs> anytime you feel like it. If you want to go in, you better make sure I'm with you. All right. In a real sense, ladies and gentlemen, this is all the text is trying to teach us this morning. You can't just stretch yourself into the presence of God based on who you think you are. You better make sure that you are with somebody who God has respect for. God has respect for the sacrifice of his son for salvation. He does not have respect for the identity of his son's servants. Come on now, come on. I'm a servant of Christ. I need to hide behind Christ. Yeah. To get into the presence of God. Amen. But then verse lets us know the result. Verse 28 lets us know the result of being concealed or of having our identities concealed by Christ. Because we are concealed by Christ, verse 28. Let's us know that race doesn't matter. Social status doesn't matter. And gender doesn't matter. For salvation in the presence of God. He 
says in verse 28, if you are in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free that deals with social status. There's neither male nor female that deals with gender. How is this so? It's because you all have been concealed with Christ. Christ has concealed your identity. So if you put on Christ, you just look like Christ. Amen. If you put on Christ, who cares if you're male or female? Mm -hmm. I need to clarify that we're speaking specifically in reference to salvation. Because many people read this verse and they misunderstand it when it comes to things, to the order of the church in the world. They read this verse and they try to just use this verse to justify women preaching and other things. Mm -hmm. Reverend, why don't you accept women into your pulpit? It says right here that if we are all in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. It says right here that if we are all in Christ, then there's neither slave nor free. It says right here that if we are all in Christ, there is neither male nor female. Mm -hmm. But the context of the passage is not talking about worldly ordinances. It's talking about what needs to be approved of in reference specifically to salvation. Oh. We know from scripture that God has an ordinance of the way he wants us to function in the world. Husband, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Husbands, love your wife. God has order. The man ought to be the head of his household. God has order. He has ways that he wants us to follow while we're in the world. But when it comes to salvation, you don't need to be a man in order to be saved. You don't need to be a woman in order to be saved. You don't need to be rich in order to be saved. You don't need any of these requirements in order to be saved. You just need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you shall be saved. Read your Bible and read it correctly and keep things in their proper perspective. Paul is talking specifically about salvation. He is not talking about the order or the structure of God, how God has ordained the church. I know that I'm made right with God because Christ has concealed my identity. My identity. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And I'm glad He did. Amen. Because on my best day, mm. when I ain't cursed nobody out, I ain't gave nobody no ugly look, I ain't put my hands on somebody I shouldn't be putting my hands on. On my best day. When I stopped at all the stop signs, obeyed all the traffic signals, used my signal light, which I don't do. On my best day, I'm just filthy rags in the sight of God. But with Christ concealing my identity, I can still get to heaven, not because of who I am, but I can get to heaven because of who Christ is. And that should be good news to anybody who knows that we are not worthy to go into the presence of God the way we are. In addition to Christ concealing our identity, the text also teaches us how we know that we are made right in the presence of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. In addition to Christ concealing our identity, the text teaches that we know that we are made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ alone because Christians are children of God through faith in Christ. Amen. We become children of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 29, Paul confirms that Christians are children of God because we rely on him for salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. To call ourselves children is an indication or is the picture of a child depending on their parent to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. All right. Hear me, church. Amen. 
The, the fact that Paul uses the word children is he's trying to paint a picture in reference to salvation. Children depend on their parents to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. He's talking in reference to salvation. There is nothing that you can do for salvation. Salvation is something that you cannot do for yourself. So he refers to us as children who need to depend on somebody else to yeah, do for yeah. us what we can't do for ourselves. Amen. Amen. If you Amen. know that you can't do it yourself, why you keep trying to do it yourself? Amen. 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 Oh my. my one year old niece got better sense than that. She was trying to open the door, couldn't get it open, walked over and said, Uncle Dooney, door. <laughs> 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 well, what you want me to do? Open. <laughs> Why you want me to open it? She couldn't go that far, but I understood it clearly because I can't open it. If I could, I wouldn't be asking you. <laughs> How old are you? Barely one. I don't know. How you spell your name? I don't know. You don't know all this fancy stuff, but you got sense enough to know how to depend on somebody else to do something that you can't do for yourself. Amen. Man. This is salvation, ladies and gentlemen. It is quite simple, actually. You don't need no master's degree. You don't need no high school diploma. You don't need no your ABCs to understand salvation. You get that you need somebody to help you do something that you can't do for yourself, don't you? You are a child of God, which means you need God to help you save you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. The text says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. Verse number 29, the beginning portion of verse number 29 opens with a first class conditional statement. And if you are in Christ. We know that in the English language there are at least three conditional statements. There's a first class conditional statement, there's a second class conditional statement, and there's a third class conditional statement. A first class conditional statement assumes that something is true. A second class conditional statement assumes that something was true. A third class conditional statement assumes that something can or will be true in the future. Here Paul uses a first class conditional statement. It assumes that the people that he is preaching to or that he's writing to are already saved. They just need to be reassured of their salvation. Just as Paul assumed that the people that he was writing to were saved and needed to be reassured of their salvation, I'm assuming this morning that the people that I'm preaching to are already saved. You just need to be reassured of the fact of how you are saved. You are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. You don't need to do anything else in order to be saved. But if you've got good sense, when you understand that you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, if you want to do something, then you just ought to learn how to say thank you. Amen. 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 It, 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 it's called a gracious gift. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Hmm. No, gracious. Forget the word gracious. It's called a gift. Hmm. Uh, okay. It's it's me giving you something mm -hmm. that you didn't do anything for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. But because we live in the world, we're not accustomed to this often. When somebody gives us something, we immediately get suspicious. <laughs> what do they want from me? Um, I need to find something to do in return to them so they won't hold this against me and bring it up years later. Talking about you remember when I bought you that double cheeseburger off of two fingers and then you went to McDonald's? <laughs> we're not accustomed to somebody just giving us something and wanting nothing in return. So when it comes to salvation and people tell us that God just gave it to you, that, that blows our mind. We, we want to know, no, I, there must be something I got to do. This is too good to be true. I have to do something to, to pay him back for what he has given to me. This is why you are called a child of God. It's because a child can do nothing to repay their parent back for all of the things that their parent has done for them. What do you say? No matter how old they get. You can never repay it. So why don't you stop trying? And just learn how to say it. There you go. You, 
you, you, you, you, if you want to do something, if, if you insist on doing something, here's what you do. Say, thank you. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I need to reassure you. It is important for Paul to reassure the people that he's writing to because false teachers have been coming into the church telling them that Jesus Christ was cool and all, but you need to be circumcised in addition to Christ. Yeah. They were coming, false teachers were coming into the church and saying, yeah, Jesus Christ is cool and all, but you also need to do this in order to be saved. Jesus is cool and all, but you also need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do this in order to be saved. And Paul says, no, I need to let you know, as I did when I first started preaching to you, that you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. You don't need to do none of that, and you don't need to do none of that. All you need to do is believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you are saved. Yeah. Christians are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is what makes you a child of God. But in the latter portion of verse 29, Paul reveals the benefit of depending on God for salvation. There is a benefit to depending on God to give you something that you cannot get yourself. He says, if you belong to Christ, Here's the benefit. Then you are Abraham's descendants. Heirs according to the promise. Abraham was a Jewish male who God had made unconditional promises to. There was nothing that Abraham did for God to select him to be the father of the Jewish nation. But the Bible lets us know in the Old Testament that God does not volunteer Abraham for salvation because Abraham was Abraham. Mm -hmm. The Bible lets us know that God volunteered Abraham for salvation because Abraham was faithful. Amen. This is what it means to be a descendant of Abraham. It does not mean to be Jewish as much as it means to be sent from God because nobody can say and do the things that you were doing if God had not sent them. And Jesus just flips the conversation because Jesus being God, knowing everything, he understood what Nicodemus really wanted when he came to him by night in the first place. So he said, Nicodemus, look, if you want to be saved, you need to be born again. Nicodemus didn't get this concept. What you mean I need to be born again? Is it possible for me to enter back into my mother's womb and be born again like that? Jesus said, no, you don't need to be born again like that. You need to be born again through baptism, by water in baptism of the Spirit. Yes. 
Nicodemus did not understand this concept. Because to Nicodemus, in order to convert from being a pagan to being a person who is worthy to receive salvation from God, you needed to be baptized. You needed to be identified with the Jewish community. But Jesus flips the script and tells them, you don't need to be identified with the Jewish community for salvation. You just need to be identified with me for salvation. And if you identify with me for salvation, then you are born again and you are welcome into the presence of God because you are identified with me. Amen, amen. You are Abraham's descendant. Mm -hmm. You are a person of faith. But not a faith. You are a person of the faith. Who believes what you need to believe in order to be saved. Amen. Anthony was sad when his father passed away. <clears throat> Don't misunderstand that. He wasn't sad because his father passed away. He, he was sad because when his father passed away, he found out that his best friend, Jeremy, Jeremy had inherited all of his father's possessions. <laughs> He, he was angry because how dare his father give Jeremy all his stuff? I'm your son. Mm -hmm. Your biological son. Yeah. But that's something you have to understand about Jeremy. You see, Jeremy was a rebellious kid who made it his business to do everything his father told him not to do. And every time Jeremy's, every time Anthony's father needed Anthony to do something, Anthony would never do it, but Jeremy would. Mm -hmm. Jeremy showed up faithfully every time Anthony's father needed Anthony to do something, but Anthony was never available, so Jeremy did it. So when Anthony's father passed away, he gave all of his possessions to Jeremy because Jeremy was the son he always wanted. Uh -huh. In a real sense, ladies and gentlemen, you don't get to heaven because of your biological connection with the Jewish people. You don't get to heaven because of your physical relation to the people that God chose at the beginning to receive salvation. You get salvation because you are faithful as God wants you to be faithful. You are the son Make me brother of Jesus. All right. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Because you are connected to Christ, you are Abraham's descendant and are entitled to receive everything that God had promised to Abraham. Amen. If you are relying on God for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, you are made right with God. That is the bottom line of the text, ladies and gentlemen. The bottom line of Paul's statements in these verses Why? is that if you are the relying on God for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, you Why? are right before God. Why? Plus or minus Last night I was uh, watching the news and uh, Mommy. there was an, an announcement made. Perhaps you heard it. The announcement was that the Astros had won game seven of this Amen, season. amen. amen. Y'all all serving long to get with me, but that's fine. <laughs> The announcement was made that the Astros had won game seven and that they would be moving on to the World Series. It had also been announced that they would be playing the, the Dodgers in the World Series. And immediately after the announcement was made, the, the anchor lady looked at her co-worker and she said, what do the Astros need to do in order to be successful? against the dog. 
The co-worker responded by saying, the Astros need to do this, and they need to do this, and they need to do this, and they need to do that. And if they do all of this stuff, they'll be successful. No. <laughs> they had no idea that I was preaching this passage, no. but I thanked them because I didn't know how I was going to approach this thing. <laughs> but this is the mentality of the world that we live in. That you need to do something to get what you want. Hmm. All right. That you need to do a list of stuff yeah. to receive what God wants to give you freely. Right. Hmm. But contrary to the world that we live in, you don't need to do a list of stuff to get salvation. God just wants to give it to you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Right. But if you must do something, yes, sir. if you want to do something, if you just fill in your soul, you got to do something. Here's what you do. Learn how to accept the gift. Oh, yes. And don't forget to tell God. Thank God. God bless you. God bless you.